I'm Kirk Harnack. On This Week in Radio Tech, we're live from WHBC in Canton, Ohio. We're going to check out the retro radio equipment closet. Hey, Chris Tarr, Chris Tobin, and Tom Ray join me on This Week in Radio Tech, coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is This Week in Radio Tech, episode 114, recorded February 1st, 2012. This old birdhouse. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Axia Audio and the new IQ Audio Console. Feature-rich, affordable IP audio consoles on the web at axiaaudio.com. It's time for This Week in Radio Tech. Hi there, I'm Kirk Harnack. I'm glad you could join us. This is the show where we talk about radio technology. And that nowadays, that includes so much. In fact, I've been working today, almost all day, with uh, an IT engineer here at a broadcast facility. So radio tech is really evolving to include a lot of things. It still includes antennas and towers and coax and connectors and, uh, and, and phone systems, even POTS lines, but it also includes lots of new technology. So here to talk about uh, old technology and new technology are my uh, partners in crime on the show. Let's uh, welcome in first from the Hudson Valley of New York, it's Tom Ray from uh, WOR and Buckley Broadcasting. Hey, Tom, how are you? Greetings, Kirk. Doing just fine. Just wearing the uh, wearing the team colors. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I'm uh, and, and I'm VP uh, Corporate Director of Engineering of Buckley Broadcasting and WOR in New York City. And uh, like I said, uh, go Giants. We're going to beat the Patriots. All right. Thanks for being with here at with us, and uh, we're going to have some things that are right up your alley, Tom. You weren't here for the pre-show meeting, but that's okay. You, you, you fall right in. Also with us okay. from New York, from, Man from Manhattan, the best dressed engineer in radio. It's uh, Chris Tobin. Hey, Chris. Hello, Kirk. Hello, Tom. I tell you, not today has been a great day in the city. It's Sixty-two degrees, nice and warm and comfortable. Yes, it is February first, though. Who knew? Um, you know, having a good time. I'm a president of CCS Music Ham for disclosure purposes. And uh, we're going to have a good time with those um, artifacts that you've uh, dug up, Kirk. <laughs> so uh, 62 in, in, New, in New York today on February 1st well, is when's Groundhog Day? Is that tomorrow? That, that's tomorrow. <laughs> so make sure you go out and buy your ground pork tonight for Groundhog Day. Okay. Think about it for a minute. not to see your sad yeah. shadow. Uh, okay. I, <laughs> I think I got that. I'd, I'd rather go back to the time when I didn't get the joke. <laughs> I, could just, I could just look confused. <laughs> So I can look confused instead of bewildered. <laughs> All right. Also with us from Muckwanago, Wisconsin, uh, the engineering uh, geek Jedi, it's Chris Tarr. Hey, Chris. Hello there. How are you? Fantastic. What's up in your world? Well, just fling an RF into the ether. That's what I do. <laughs> it is what we do, isn't it? Oh, we fling something. Um, <laughs> what's, go what's going on in your world besides flinging uh, RF? Well, let's see. I'm uh, Director of Engineering for Intercom's radio stations in Madison, Milwaukee, contributing writer for Radio Guide, and all-around good guy. So I've been uh, you know, do a little bit of IT, I do a little bit of engineering, I do some contract work. I'm all over the place. <laughs> well, well, we're going to be all over the place in terms of uh, timelines on this show. Last week, our subject matter was all over the place. This week, it's the timeline that's all over the place. Oh, I'm giving away some of the clue here. You know what that is? I'll show you in a second. Um, our show is brought to you by Axia Audio, definitely in the here and now. Uh, Axia Audio on the web at axiaaudio.com. We'll be telling you about IQ consoles here in just a little while. Let's jump right into it. Uh, we, we're we're going to um, talk about some of the – here, I'll, I'll set it up. Uh, today I made a, a little trip over to Canton, Ohio. And I'm, I'm being hosted by the, the, the folks here at WHBC. <laughs> they have an AM and an FM here, 1480 AM and 94.1 FM. Uh, the AM is uh, is news talk, and the FM is uh, is an AC format. And um, the, the the building here uh, in Canton is just absolutely gorgeous. It's an Art Deco building built in 1939, and they're still in the same building. This is the same lobby 
that they had in 1939. It is, I, I wish I could pan the camera around. It is absolutely gorgeous. The, the entrance to the, the restroom is over here, and it's got uh, beautiful mirrors and a round window that you can't see through, of course, on the on the, the men's room. Ladies' room, the powder room is the same over here. There's gorgeous leather furniture with uh, beautiful wood piping around it. It is absolutely, oh, yeah, hey, here's a, here's a picture of the, uh, the, the building. Let's see if we can bring this right in here. Can we see that? There you go. There's WHBC, the outside, and, and uh, just a gorgeous Art Deco, Art Deco building. Man, I'd like to work at a place like this. It's absolutely beautiful. Well, well you, you, well, you know, we can see a... the studio doors behind you, Kirk, and, and they're, they're unbelievable. They really are, you know, the yeah. big window on it. And... Oh, yeah, over there is a, uh, uh, let's see, uh, well, I, and I can't control the camera right now, but, yeah, there are some studio doors, and it's, a, it's an amazing place, just gorgeous. And they've kept it. They not only kept it in great shape, but, of course, the things that needed updating, they've updated. So they've got a lot of new infrastructure here, a newer infrastructure. Uh, they're about to go to a new SIP phone system here in the next year or so. They're going to get rid of the POTS lines, and they'll have uh, all the lines coming in on, uh, as, uh, as Ethernet, uh, you know, as SIP trunks. And, so they, you know, they, and, of course, audio processing is thoroughly modern. Transmitters are, are thoroughly modern. And uh, they, uh, some of the stu studio gear is, is uh, you know, what, 10, 12 years old, and some of it's up to date. So really, you know, quite a variety, but um, it's, just, it's just great to be in, in this good-looking building. Well, about 20 minutes before we were going to start the show here, I, I came down here to, to do some consulting with the engineers. We're looking at some Telos gear and uh, helping them get that connected and, find, you know, fixing a, a couple of software issues. And I, I thought, guys, you know what? How about if, we, if I just have dinner here in Canton and we'll do the show from here? And they said, absolutely, let's do it. So here we are. I'm just delighted to, to be hosted here at the, the gorgeous WHBC studios. Well, before the show started, um, uh, Dale, uh, Dale Lamb, the engineer here, said, uh, hey, you know, I've got some, I got some cool old stuff you might want to show on, on, uh, on your show tonight. Well, let's see it. So we walk down to the to the, to the storage room downstairs, and it's a treasure trove of, of interesting uh, things, some of them old, some of them not so old. So I thought we'd run few of, uh, through a few of these, take a walk down memory lane, and actually talk about some of the technology involved in some of these items. Sound good? Is it a plan? Say sure. yes. Sounds like yes. a plan Good idea, Kirk. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's, let's begin uh, with something here. Let's begin with something really old. Really old. I have never actually held one of these in my hand before, and uh, how heavy how is well that? You, can... you know, it's it, this is this one's not too bad at all. It's uh, let's see, compared to the Heil mic, it's a little heavier than the Heil mic. Um, <laughs> what is this? A this is a carbon microphone. Yeah. Yep. I think. Yep. That's so what it's it a is. A carbon mic. Uh, okay. So how do these things? What kind of connectors on the end? Oh, there's a bare wire. Okay. Did these require some voltage, some battery voltage across them? I guess so. It doesn't make its own power. I would think so, uh, kind of like a telephone. You have to put a little bit of uh, voltage across there to, to get a voltage difference to make the uh, to make it work. Right. So it's the the element. I guess is just not too much different than a, a carbon button uh, uh, microphone on on a phone. Uh, it's it's uh, held in place with springs, so it, you know it, it you can bump it a little bit and won't carry a, over too much to the mic. I would imagine you had to talk pretty loud into it. Uh, and there'd be a little um, um, area in there with some carbon granules, and the, your voice pressure would uh, push the diaphragm and change the uh, uh, how hard packed the the carbon granules are, and thereby change the resistance, the instantaneous resistance of electricity going through it. So you put a little electricity going through it, and you get changes in resistance. And then at, at the other end, where the amplifier is, let me guess, you'd probably put a capacitor uh, in in series with uh, with a leg of that. Uh, and um, that would get you the, uh, the, you know, the AC voltage, the, what was coming off of this thing, and then you run that into a preamplifier, and you amplify the heck out of it, and you get, you get voice or music or whatever's coming into it. That's cool. You guys have any experience with, uh, with mics like this? None of us are that old, are we? I, I haven't seen one like that, Kirk, but I've seen a carbon mic that uh, uh, it was a Western Electric, which was all fully enclosed. It, it wasn't set up like that. Um, that weighed, weighed a ton, but it was gorgeous. I, I mean, it's like it, it's unbelievable. That, that's a very cool mic. That really is. Hmm. I'm looking for a brand on, on this guy, and so far I'm not seeing one. You guys know a brand on this thing, Dale? Any uh, idea? Not a Western Electric. Uh, maybe it's made by maybe it's made by the the Canton Microphone Company. <laughs> An RCA. Build. Oh, that's right. This whole place was an RCA build. You open up the RCA catalog, and say yes, I want that radio station. And they'd come in and, you know, build the whole thing for you. So, 
All right. Uh, let's move to a different microphone. Ugh, this one is heavy. Now, this looks also looks like a, a carbon uh, microphone with a carbon capsule in it. Let's see. Is there any? Man, I feel just so dumb not knowing about this old stuff. Sure has a lot of like screws a telephone in it. Look at all these. Yeah, Does yeah, it? yeah. Those look like a telephone uh, microphone setup. Well, it's got a lot of screws around here. Hold, must be holding the diaphragm uh, really securely. Otherwise, why would you need so many of these? So there's a diaphragm probably stretched between uh, these these plates right here. Boing, sorry. And um, and then there's there's this assembly here, which must hold the carbon uh, module uh, firmly in place. And then the the diaphragm moves uh, moves against that. But it's also very spring loaded, and it's on a it's a it's a modern or you know somewhat modern stand that it's on. Um, this one doesn't have any wires on it, so we'll set that one aside. Those are really pretty old. Now, none of us as, as engineers have ever dealt with any of, of, of those microphones. Uh, let's see. We have uh, – oh, now here's one that's a bit more modern. In fact, it even has a, an XLR connector on the end of it. Uh, this one does say RCA. On it. Let's hold it yep. up. Let me hold it. <laughs> oh, I have RCA. seen those before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've seen those. Uh, those are popular. I've seen it. Now, uh, is, is, is this or is this not what they call a shower microphone? Because it kind of looked like a shower head. No? I don't, I don't think I've heard that well, phrase, but uh, see what you're saying. This, this, would be, this would be a dynamic mic. In other words, it's not powered. Uh, it, it, it's got a, you know, a, a coil that moves. A diaphragm moves a coil. There's a permanent magnet in there, and, and the, the coil moves past the permanent magnet, thereby making minute amounts of electricity that come out here uh, on the XLR connector. Um, this does look like a standard size mic uh, um, stand, uh, you know, mic stand holder. I'll bet I could, you know, replace this Heil mic with with this guy, and it would work. You want to give it a try? Yeah, let's give it a try. I want to hear it. Yeah. All right. All right. Hang on. Let me yeah. Why not? Table here. All right. Now my audio is going to go away for I'm a second. RCA you, you, you guys. You guys run the show for a second. Uh, in keeping with the theme, I'm using a RCA microphone ribbon mic here in the video for those that can see it. The, the baby oh, was yeah, a 44. Oh, I think they hey, check one. this out. Yeah, it's a classic. Check this out. What do you it, think? Oh, it does yeah. Work. Yeah, it does work. It, it even sounds. It's got a. It's got a, a, a warmth to it. It's kind of cool. Hello. You sound like it would. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, I kind of like that. <laughs> How about that? All right, let's put the Heil back in here. This so is can, London. Hey, uh, I'm calling. Chris, t t tell us about that, that mic you're using while I'm changing this. This is uh, one of the classic shapes that you'll see from time to time. Uh, I think these call, used to be called the Baby 44s, the, uh, was it the uh, RCA 44 microphone. It's a ribbon mic inside uh, the ribbon. It's aluminum. If you can picture uh, an accordion-type piece of aluminum, maybe about a half, not a half inch, a quarter inch wide, and suspended between uh, two magnets. And as the... Air from your voice hits the other oh, sound from your voice hits the uh, the uh, aluminum foil. It vibrates, creates a current, passes it through the wire into the XLR connector. Uh, if you're speaking of warmth and very wide dynamic range, these microphones tend to have that sound. They are unique in their sound. They don't require close miking. So you know, traditionally talking up real close like this isn't necessary. Actually, will damage it. Uh, it's uh, it's a really cool mic. Actually, this microphone still works. And uh, I've used it on a couple of remote broadcasts over the years. A couple of program directors wanted some retro-looking things during the holidays at the uh, outside broadcast, so we used it. It was pretty cool. And uh, I have to say, ribbon mics definitely have a unique sound that, uh, unfortunately, I think has been lost in some of the newer uh, styles of audio uh, recordings and, uh, and audio re reproductions. Well, oh. didn't those mics make uh, Frank Sinatra sound pretty good? Or did he just say made a way? lot of? They made a lot of people sound good you know better than they were or just enhance i always like to say that a good microphone just brings the true tone of your voice to the audience you may or you already have the talent it just helps bring it out extend it further that's all so for frank sinatra and others yes the vocal this is a very nice vocal microphone all right uh, i'm going to pick on the young whippersnapper in, in the in the crowd here and that would be chris tar chris I don't, can you see this connector very well let me hold it up a little close to the camera there we go that's a mic connector. What kind of mic is on the other end of this cable? An old one. <laughs> <laughs> you are right. Awesome. Yeah. You are correct, uh, sir. Chris, 
<laughs> That's why they call you the Geek Jedi. That's right. I was like that. <laughs> well, this is going to be great. I can't wait to show you this. This is the mic on the other end of... Remember now, it's this cable. See that? See that? Look at what's on the... Okay, the, the, the cable is this cotton cable. It's very... It's frayed in some places. I'll show you what it's frayed of in just a second. Here we go. Are you, are you ready? Uh, oh, my Lord. It's a mailbox. It's, <laughs> it's a mail... It's a... It is what they call it? A birdhouse. A, a birdhouse or mailbox microphone. Look at that. Look wow. at that WHBC. Oh, my goodness. Um, That's cool. I, I, I don't know how you, I, you just, you talk in this end of the thing. What, what's all this for? What's in here? Somebody hold it for you while you're doing it. That's, Are that's, there, you think there's, you, hmm? go ahead. There's probably stuff inside, but uh, it, I, my guess is that it, it's to protect the microphone. Yeah, maybe you take it either to a noisy location or to a, uh, um, Something you know, maybe some place that might have windows. I, I I don't know. I don't know, but it's very cool. <laughs> well, it, it is worth noting that this is a microphone number one. If you can see on the back there, you see this is this is mic number one from WHBC. <laughs> um, uh, that's that's just absolutely amazing. Uh, Dale, uh, Dale's nearby. Dale's the, uh, the 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 chief here. Would you have any interest in, in popping the screws off this thing and having a look inside? Or, or do you feel too I'll nervous that. about that? I'll take that offline it, and do that. It looks I'm like right it's, got, it's got two here, two here, and one's missing. So it's got a total of five, um, five standard screws on it. And it looks like the top will I'll bet you there's a tube or two in there. I'll, I'll bet the preamp is in there. So, okay. all right, Dale. Give me, give me five, ten minutes. Sure, take, take your time. We, we, we got 45 more minutes. <laughs> so, all right, so that, that, that was pretty cool. What, how can we top that? I don't know that we can. Um, you know, have, have any of you ever, and surely you've gone into stations where they had an old mic, either on air or on a shelf somewhere? Oh, sure. H have, have they looked like any of these we've pulled out so far? Uh, yeah, well, the one, the one small, uh, like you called it, the shower mic, I actually have one of those in the shop. Oh, okay. All right. Do you use I've a shower mic, and we've had a 44 DX, which is similar to well, not similar, but it's 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 the one Johnny Carson had on his desk. Uh, I've seen some of those, and uh, the Western Electric that was kind of um, like those RCA uh, carbon mics, except they were fully enclosed. Ah, okay, sure. So they had something something around them. Yeah. Yep. Well, I, I have another mic. I guess I guess we'll go ahead and get get all the mics out of the way here. Um, here's here's another one. This is uh, this thing is this dog is heavy, and uh, there's what it looks like from the side. See, and yeah, I've seen those. I'll show you the connector in just a moment. But that, that's a it must have a big big diaphragm in there. Just a and a, of course gorgeous mic flag on it. Let's see. There's some there is a, 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 a plaque here. Can I read it or not? Oh, it's RCA. It does say RCA on it, and my tired old eyes can't quite read all the. Stuff on it. it looks like uh, it's got a serial number of forty fifty E, or maybe that's the model number. Uh, yeah, that's the model number forty fifty E, and serial number four zero six seven. Maybe they started at four thousand. Maybe they didn't. I don't know. But what's interesting about this mic is the audio connector that's on it. I'll hold this up, and I don't know if you can see inside there or not. There are AC cords that would fit that. Yeah, that looks like an IEC <laughs> connector. It, it doesn't have, they're round, they're, you know, they're pegs, not, not blades. Um, hmm. But you could get in a great deal of trouble, <laughs> I think, with, with, with this if you tried to plug it in like that. But man, this thing, this thing weighs, seriously, I, th this must be eight pounds. That is just amazing. Let's see what it says on the back here. Oh, well, the connector on the back was made by Canon. We've all used the word, oh, that's got a Canon connector. But, you know, Canon made a lot of different connectors, I suppose. Canon, Los Angeles. Oh, so there you go. All right. Uh, uh, Dale's back with uh, the birdhouse uh, microphone. And what's it got, Dale? I All am right. surprised. Oh, Ooh, look wow. at that. Very look cool. Look at that. It, it's got, so it has a tube missing, it looks like. There's a socket there with nothing in it. It's uh, like a 
pad or, or a, a maybe a, a pad or a filter goes there. It's got a okay. battery. Oh, I want to hold. I want to hold this up to the camera. Hmm. A portable mic. There's a there's a battery in there. Wow. Look at that. Check that and out. And the two tubes. Huh. Holy moly. Wow. That's just amazing. So it. So these. So what are these tubes? I wonder. They're in. They're socketed. What? Well, I, uh, I don't know. They feel. Uh, Oh, 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 I don't want to break anything. Oh, it's, is it wiggling? Is it coming? Yeah, it's coming out. Okay, a little slowly but surely. Ah, okay. What is that? Uh, I'm not seeing a, I'm seeing what used to be a, a little logo on the top of it. And I'm not seeing any mark. Okay, well, let's look on the base. Uh, the, the tube brand is Cunningham. Mm. I was not expecting that. I was not expect. I was expecting to see RCA or Western Electric or something on GE there. GE or but, yeah, yeah, Cunningham. And let's see, um, it is a CX three four zero, a Cunningham CX three four zero. Watch Kirk Harnack this- as he goes through the wild looking for strange microphones. <laughs> Crikey! <laughs> Uh, and what is this one? Oh, interesting. Now, why would they have a, a tube in there labeled that? Unsatisfactory. <laughs> you gotta, when you buy a birdhouse microphone, be sure you check the tubes inside because they may be like this one, unsatisfactory. Um, it's yes, probably these were made the, the that, un- <laughs> that, that tube is, a, uh, Kirk is a triode. Um, okay, the, 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 the CX340. Yep, it's the CX340 is a triode, and what I found so far it doesn't tell us like things like what the filament voltage is. But uh, let's see what this one says. It's got it's got uh, four connectors. Filaments, so it's it's got to be a triode. Five volts, five volts at a quarter amp. Quarter amp. Yep. It's it it's okay. So here here's what, here's the base. It's, it's four connectors. So that means it's got to be a triode That's tube. Standard. It's got two for the, the the filament, one for the grid, and one for the plate. Right. So it's and just it's a simple made by Cunningham. It's made by Cunningham ET in Harrison, New Jersey. Yep. Harrison, New Jersey. Radio production right. between now, 1915 and 1920. What? Just five years worth? Uh, that's what I'm so finding. I'm trying th- to. That would mean that this thing was 19 years old at the earliest when they bought it. I, I don't. Know. Seems like they'd produce them longer than that. Anyway, hey, check this one more thing out. Uh, I, I don't know if this sticker was. If it was applied to this tube later on or whatever. But if I know the economics of radio stations, it, this is probably true. Let's get a close-up on, on the sticker right there. They bought this thing at, oh, let me turn it right the right way, at, look at this, Western Auto Supply Company. And it's, and oh, it's checked un, unsatisfactory. <laughs> and they bought wow. it at the tire store in town. That's great. Western um, Auto. <laughs> Looking at some history of radio manufacturing, it seems that on uh, June 15th, 1920, Cunningham gets two agreements with new RCA, with the new RCA, where he has to drop his production and gets deliveries granted by RCA for his trade name in 1920. So that's, that's when it stopped with the name Cunningham and it went to RCA. There's a date wow. on the battery we talked about earlier. Oh, my goodness. Let's see. If What's the born on date? The born on date. <laughs> <laughs> you used sept- by... September 1931. D- does that look the voltage, Kirk? Uh, on the battery? I haven't seen that just yeah. yet. It's soldered in place, so I can't turn it around too much. I'm, I'm wondering what the heck um, the battery is doing in that because it looks like it's something that would be powered it, by that cord. It does. It does. It's the 5 volt I mean, battery. The battery didn't... It's a 5 volt battery. Did that supply the, the filament voltage? No, I way. can't imagine. No, maybe that's, that was a bias that's voltage. Sep- that's September 1931. That's the date they tell you to put it in service by. So <laughs> that's the use by date. So you know it was made well before that, or at least a bit before that. Well, it doesn't have a copper um, top, so it's probably not any good anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing it doesn't. I'm guessing it's dead. <laughs> oh my goodness! Wow, that's just amazing. Anything else to really check out there? I guess check the phone uh, lining. Oh tell yeah, him, uh, uh, tell, him thing, they... tell him thanks for tell him thanks for doing that. By the way, for taking that apart. Yeah, for thanks, for, thanks for popping that off. I appreciate you taking yeah, that risk. Thank there. you. There's a so the inside of this has a foam lining, and by the way, the foam is still in good shape. From how many years ago is this? What is it, from 31 to, to to 2011? How many years is that? Is that 80 years? 
Damn. From 31 to 2011. And, and we know that, yeah. well, we think the tubes only made were made well before that. Positively amazing. Okay. Thanks, Dale. Appreciate that. <laughs> All these things are making a mess on the desk. Oh, um, it's technology. Just, it, it's just, where is it? Where has it come to? I mean, now we have we have Bob Heil making th these mics, and of course, there's lots of mic companies, and they're all, you know, they're all highly sophisticated, very, uh, um, very close tolerances and and good design. I mean, even a mic like this is is so directional. I think Bob or or Leo have demonstrated this on the network before, but I'm talking right into it, and you get off to the side, and the volume just goes way, 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 way down and back here, and you can hardly hear me. Right, and here I am back. Wow. Um, so let, let's take a minute and uh, and recall, you guys, surely you've had experiences coming across old radio gear. Have you found a piece of old radio gear that you were able to to put to use? Uh, I mean, as something besides a paperweight or make it into a table lamp? I've got an old radio that's uh, uh, upstairs in the living room that's uh, put to good use. It still works. It's 1930 Philco Cathedral that works like a champ. Now, is, is, is that a big piece of furniture or a tabletop? Radio? It's a table. It's a tabletop. I'm gonna say, oh, let's see. It's about yeah, that tall, maybe a little taller. It's got, um, I think, seven tubes in it. Uh, big speaker, and uh, it, it it looks like a it, it it gets the name because it looks like a cathedral window that you'd find on a church. Um, and and the interesting thing about about radios from that era and before is if you if. It, if you take out the speaker, if you look at the speaker, if you unplug it, they actually plug in. The um, the speaker has a little four prong plug on it. And you sit there and go four prongs. It's a speaker. <laughs> well, what they okay. Well, what they do is is two of those prongs are used for the audio for the voice coil. The other two yeah. are used for an electromagnet that's on there that works with the voice coil, but it doubles as a uh, as a filter choke for the power supply. Hmm. Oh. So did it not need a permanent magnet then in the speaker because they made their own magnet? It, they, they made their own magnet, and like I said, it, double, it doubled as a filter choke for the power supply, so it didn't need a separate filter choke to make it even more heavier than it already is. So hmm. why, um, why didn't the speaker hum if the coil's being used as a choke? You know there's pulsating DC coming into it. That's a good question. I have no clue, but they did work. <laughs> wow. Let's, uh, Chris Tar, you, you work at a place there that's that's been around for a while there, and uh, uh, doesn't you know your, your transmitter building is is pretty old, kind of an Art Deco style. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, there's not a lot. You know, there's not a lot equipment wise left. We have a couple of old microphones. Of course, our transmitter is a you know our, our backup transmitter is a 1957 RCA. So that in itself is kind of ancient. Uh, you know, other really all we have that's that's old is is things like paperwork, pictures. Uh, that sort of thing, which I, I mean, I, I keep very well, uh, take very good care of. You know, I, uh, it seems like over time people, you know, they go in and they clean and they throw that stuff out. And they don't care. You know, they don't appreciate it the way we do. So I, I've taken great care to kind of preserve a lot of those, you know, the old ledgers and pictures. And, and, uh, and we, in fact, we even have old transmitter logs from, uh, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, logging readings and things on some of the transmitters. But um, I really haven't run across a lot of of what I would consider really old gear, you know, a lot of just kind of 60s, 70s vintage stuff. Okay, uh, Dale's Dale's bringing me some photographs here from the station from the days of yesteryear. Uh, this, hold this up as still as I can for you. We can do the little zoom thing on Skype. You guys are masters at that. That's pretty good. This is the original transmitter at St. John's Church Rectory Boiler House. So the boiler house wow. of the church rectory at 6th and McKinley uh, back in the late 1920s. Now, now Kirk, when did WHBC sign on the air? Well, I don't know because they told me this building was from 39. So obviously they were on the air before this 25. building. 25, 1925. Hmm. I, I wonder so, if that transmitter was actually built rather than, rather, yeah, I mean, maybe bought as a kit and built because they did that a lot in those days. Dale, do you know if the transmitter was built and bought as a kit, built on site? It was a 10 watt. Uh, it was a homebrew. A 10 watt homebrew. Oh my hmm. God, it's as big as a five kilowatt today. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Okay, check this out. That 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 big cone thing on the wall there in the upper part of the picture, that's a speaker, isn't it? Yeah, that's a studio speaker. 
And the door there says this is the WHBC Blue Room Studio. Hmm. And, and that's something. So this looks like an, a little ante room outside, like a like the green room or something. Oh, it's a different location. Yeah, okay. And so here's, look at this ornate and beautiful and comfortable music performance room with all the, the curtains going on there and the microphones, piano. Kind of looks like Snooky's yeah, very bedroom. <laughs> Snooky looks like Snooky's bedroom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Guys. Uh, here is a, here's a, a control board, and it looks like a, a, a t master control. And uh, is that turntable, is, is, is that a lathe, a cutting lathe on the turntable? Kind of looks like it. Looks like it. You could actually yeah, cut, cut a transcription knows. there. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> Good job, Burks, this, uh, zooming around. It's awesome. It's amazing wow. what a $30 camera and a, and a, and a $10,000 uh, video console will do. Um, <laughs> and, you, and you know what's amazing? <laughs> that uh, that turntable there probably used a washing machine motor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it probably did use a, use a washing machine motor. Now, this picture, I don't... Oh, somebody needs to Google this. Who, what artist had an album called Why, Wise, or no, Wide, Wide World? Wide, Wide World. This is Studio C at uh, WHBC. Anybody know what wow. kind of console that is? Pretty amazing. I can't tell. Yeah, three, three turntables, I suppose, because they 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 may have played commercials from transcription discs. So it it took three uh, three turntables to, or maybe there may have been four there. No, three at least. Oh, look what's next to the chair right here, right where my finger is. You know what that is? That is an ashtray. Always close at <laughs> <home>. <laughs> and, and here's this here's this album I was speaking of. Uh, wide, wide world. I just wonder who the artist is on that album. I'm looking it up. I it's can't a man. Find, I, I, I find. Why, I'm looking. I can't find Aaron, it either. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron O'Donnell music. It says I've, on Amazon, but that's no. She's too modern. All right. Uh, let's see. We already had that picture. Let's look at. Oh, so Dale, this is like a transmitter room right here, doesn't it? It's a second site. A second site. Oh, now, now. In modern times now, WHBC has a daytime AM site and a nighttime AM site. So this was one of the, the one of the two sites, huh? 1947. 1947 for this 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 place. There we go. Wow. <laughs> they don't it's, make iron like that anymore. That's pretty, for sure. They don't make iron like that anymore. That's for sure. Oh, you got to see the floor here. You got to see this floor. Oh, wow. Check this out. Now that's What's awesome. on the floor? That is all kinds. I got to do that in the carpeting of my new building. That is all kinds of <laughs> that's awesome. That's very cool. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Isn't that gorgeous? Now, that's right here where we are now, isn't it, Dale? Yeah, that's, that, that's the hallway that's literally starts five feet from where I'm sitting right now. Uh, Ten feet. That's awesome. Isn't that gorgeous? Oh, man. I'm, this, is the, this is one of the best shows we've done. Wow. Oh, man. How come, how come when I plan the show, it sucks, and when somebody else is involved, it just comes out great? Uh, let's see. We have, oh, oh, look at this. Look at what says on, on the bottom of this picture here. If we can zoom into the bottom of the picture, the words at the bottom. It says the new and modern WHBC. And now we take a look at these pictures. <laughs> Isn't that great? Isn't that just awesome? Wow. wow. What would it be like to work in, in this place at that time? There, there's, there's the building and that's the building I'm in right now. And it, it, you know, doesn't look too much different than that. The, Cars outside are, are, you know, a little more up to date. But <laughs> all right, we're all, we're 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 almost done with the show and tell portion. Of, well, this part of, we still have some more more equipment to go. Ah ah, okay. Um, this this is the room I'm in right now, and I don't know what the date on this is, but would you say it's from the uh, the the mid forties? Maybe. Hmm. 40s, maybe 50s, but no. 30, oh, this is 39. That. This, this is, this is when the building was open. Okay, this, this is before, before the war, before the war. Wow. And the, the, the clock on the clock on the wall up here is, um, it, there's still a clock behind me right now, but it, they changed the face of it. But they still have this, this sign right here that shows which studio is on the air. Beneath, behind the glass here, they can light up an A, a B, or a C. 
hmm. that tells you which studio is on air. And there's a reception desk in, in the middle of this room right now. It's right behind me. So, um, who's this? Oh, 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 okay. Gotcha. Remember a little while ago, we looked at, at this microphone, right? This thing that weighs a ton. <clears throat> you could hurt somebody with this. You could kill somebody with that microphone. Well, <clears throat> here we are. They're interviewing the pig right there with that very <laughs> microphone. And then I, I wonder who's in, in this picture right here. I almost thought I recognized the guy, but it's not, an, not a famous actor, is it? Okay. This man on the street being interviewed with that very same microphone, the very one that I was holding. Ah, now check this out. Here, here's the remote truck right here. A Woody. A Woody. Is that what that is? And is that know, what they call those? And if I'm not mistaken, to get the signal back to the station in those days, if they did it, they did it on a shortwave frequency that was around 40 megahertz. That's right. You think it's <laughs> really? Oh yeah, around around 40 megahertz. Okay. Well, what what about the um, the RPUs that were just above the AM band, like around 1.6 megahertz? They shared those with the Remember police. Those? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that was police calls. Yeah. I have one more picture. I'm not sure how this studio was used because the, the turntable looks very lonely. <laughs> looks, looks, looks more like a, a room to audition uh, records. It's probably a transcription turntable. Tra transcriptions, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Uh, not, not a cutting lathe. Well, maybe. Amazing. Well, uh, I have a few more things to show. Some of them is old, some of them is not, but let's... Take a moment right now and take a break and listen and hear from uh, our sponsor of This Week in Radio Tech. Happens to be the folks that I work for, and so I'm so blessed to, A, work for them, B, they, they pay for part of the show, and that's uh, Axia Audio. Uh, Axia Audio is uh, a place where you can uh, – the people who invented uh, audio consoles that use audio over IP. Now, uh, Axia, uh, um, we had to invent a standard to make this work. We call it LiveWire because before that existed, before we – did that you put together the the, 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 the standard audio protocols uh, that LiveWire uses. We put them together in such a way and, and developed a clocking system that allows very low latency over IP connections. And this had been a problem up to that point. Up until 2004 or so, you just you're, if you put audio over IP, you were going to have more latency than you could stand between your microphone and, and your headphones. And, of course, that's, that's critical for, for a disc jockey. So uh, the development teams in, uh, in the U.S. and in Latvia uh, together collaborated and developed what is now called LiveWire. There's a whole book written about LiveWire by Steve Church and Skip Peasy. So you ought to check that out on, on Amazon uh, sometime. Um, well, this is developed to the point now where we have uh, lots of consoles. There's over 2,500 Axia audio consoles in service today around the world. So does the tech work? Yeah. Uh, plenty of partners partner with Axia. Uh, lots of automation companies, hardware companies like 25.7. Uh, even, other, even other console companies like Radio Systems have partnered with uh, Axia, it, putting live wire into their consoles. There's satellite receivers that contain uh, live wire and let you connect with just one cable, plug it into your Ethernet switch, and route that audio all around the, the studio plant wherever you want it. So, um, oh, and you may have heard some interesting news. Uh, the folks at Orban have now partnered with Axia for putting live wire technology into some Orban products. I don't know what they're going to be. Well, I guess we'll find out when they, when they come out. Well, uh, a, uh, a development that uh, Axia has come up with in the last year or so has been the IQ console. And this is a very flexible uh, audio console, the IQ. Uh, it uh, begins life with uh, eight faders and a box that, uh, that goes in your rack that has all the audio inputs and outputs, including microphone uh, inputs. Uh, it also has a GPIO for contact closures to control equipment that's, that's around the console. And it has a built-in Ethernet switch. So no longer do you have to buy a separate Ethernet switch uh, to go in a studio like, well, like our co-host Tom Ray did. Tom bought an Ethernet switch for each of his studios at WOR. Uh, this new console has the switch built right in. So it's very easy to connect studios together and to connect them to a master control area where you then can put an Ethernet switch and connect all your items in the, in, in the rack room or master control area. The IQ console can expand uh, eight faders is what it starts at. You can expand it to 16 faders or even up to 24 faders. And even at 24 faders, the list price is around $12,000 U.S. 
So it's a heck of a deal. 24 faders for 12,000. It's all live wire, IP audio. It's really cool. So I encourage you to check it out. Go to the web and check out axiaaudio.com. Check out all the partners and, and see how easy it is. There's a couple of videos there on the homepage. Uh, I, along with uh, Rachel Bernard, uh, recorded a video on how to hook up a, an Axia system pretty quickly. Uh, two videos there, 10 minutes long each. You're going you're gonna to enjoy watching that. We, we configure the console and everything. Check it out, axiaaudio.com. And thank you, Axia Audio, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, on with the tour. What are we going to show you next? There's something a bit more modern that we don't use very much anymore. Who knows what this is? <laughs> Fidela pack cart. Audio that, pack. Yeah, that is it. it audio pack. Uh, uh, audio, yeah, audio pack. Audio pack. So Fidela pack is another brand of these cards. Eight. Yeah, an eight, eight, uh, four. 70 eight, seconds. Now, what, 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 bottom. What, yeah, you're right. It's 70. How, how did he know that? Oh, it says 70 right there on the bottom. And that's so, got a uh, bias of what? 250 nano webbers. <laughs> that that would be the flux level. Um, uh, so, uh, Chris Tar, I haven't heard much from you. Tell the audience what this is. Oh, I mean, my the, goodness. The, the technology uh, inside here. Find this. The technology inside, it's a uh, continuous loop cartridge. And uh, essentially, the, the tape loops are out in on itself. And the way that it works is, is uh, it uses a, a tone to tell the machine when to stop playing it back. So essentially, what happens is you is it, it self-cues, so you put the cartridge in. It should be if the who, guy who was on the air before you let it cue back up, ready to play. You press the button, it starts playback, and then it continues to run until it comes back around again to where the audio started and then shuts off, and then the cartridge is ready to play again. And, and because it's a continuous loop, there's no fast-forwarding or rewinding or anything else needed. You just hit the play button and, and let it go. Uh, of course, it didn't always work that way. Uh, you know, it required uh, the, the maintenance on those, the machines to play those back. Uh, pretty high maintenance because obviously you had record and playback heads. It's a magnetic tape. Looks a lot like an 8-track. And uh, so, you know, it required a lot of maintenance to keep them sounding good. And they had uh, pressure pads. But uh, Kirk's pointing to is, is uh, that would be the return. The loop. Coming back, the, yeah. loop, the loop there. And that hub would sit on nylon washers and would spin around. Ah. And then... Uh, You'd splice the tape to make it a continuous loop. On the front are pressure pads, which a lot of uh, guys on the air would know those pads would tend to fall off as they dried up. And, and it would really machine. sound like this if they did that. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Another thing you could do is you could, you could actually rebuild those. And I actually used to – I made a pretty good living, a little side business, rebuilding carts for people a long, long time ago. I probably still have the cart winder somewhere. But I would take those apart and I could re rebuild them and put any link that you wanted on there. With, with fresh tape and put in new pads and, and uh, you know, new, new uh, washers on the, on the platters and on the spindles and everything and, and clean them up and make them look pretty and, again, wind them to any length you wanted. So, but that was, that was pretty uh, much a standard for many, many, many years for, for, for playing back audio. That was pretty much you walked into a radio station, uh, you would see those lying around. They were used mostly in the beginning for commercials and then later on, you know, into the 80s, stations pretty much played everything, music and, and spots and everything on those carts. Yeah. Well, there is a practical you know, limit to the tape loop length, too, yeah. and uh, it's about 11 and a half to 12 minutes before uh, uh, you're, you're out of space <laughs> on that actual reel in there, and the machine just can't pull it anymore. Yeah. But they had bigger ones. They had bigger carts than this that would hold uh, close to half an hour. Right. Yeah. And, and I, the most popular machine machine to play bigger ones tough. were in delay machines. Yeah. I uh, yeah. So, uh, have Chris, you said you've, you've wound your own carts, and certainly I have too. You, you, you buy the right lubricated tape that would, ru would rub against itself okay, and you'd wind it in here, and then you had to splice it. There's, there's a splice in this continuous loop of tape. Um, did you ever wind them with the wrong side out? <laughs> Actually, no, because the, the, the machine that oh, I used for Oh, because you're the engineer. Winder. That's why. That's right. No, the, well, because I, would, I had a cart winder. So, I mean, when I put the, the platter of, of tape down, you know, as long as you just spool it correctly, it always wind the right way. So I've never really had an issue with that. Um, I have done it where, you know, you, 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 the, the secret with, with re rebuilding those and putting your own tape in, though, was that take-up loop on the back where it fed back into the spool. If you had that too tight or too loose – you either the cart the machine wouldn't play because the tape would be too tight on the spool, or it'd be so loose that when you stopped the the, the spindle would continue to spin, platter would spin, and you get tape wound up on the inside of it. So there really was kind of a secret uh, sauce to how to get that right and get just the right amount of yep. tension and the right amount of give on that on the tape when you built up the loop. The other thing is is how well you could splice because 
Uh, there were some uh, cart uh, erasers that you could put in there and it would find the splice. So when it erased, it would find the splice for you so that you wouldn't be recording over a splice. Because what would happen is if there was a bad splice and you had audio going over it, the audio would have a dropout where the splice was. So it was also a function of how well you, you know, how good of a job you did doing the splice and, and everything else was, you know, if you could hear it when it rolled over your splice. So I bring in good memories of that. I, used to, I remember many evenings sitting there with the, in front of the cart winder building carts. Uh you mentioned about getting the right amount of tape on here and get the tension just right. You're right. That was so critical. But remember what the folks at uh, 3M, at, at, at uh, uh, Scotch, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Yeah, the ITC cards. Remember what they did? They had, yeah. they had a, a Scotch tension cards. Yeah, they, yeah. A tension, a tensioner built into it. That was pretty well, they, cool. They, the Scotch um, cards also didn't have tape pads. They relied strictly on the tension to keep the tape up against the heads. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. No, no, uh, no little <laughs> uh, foam pad. And, oh, I can – oh, these are suffering. These are worn out. You push them in, they stay in. That's bad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no tension on those. So the, the, the hole in the bottom here was for what? Pinch, pinch roller. roller. The pinch roller. The pinch roller would pop up. It would go whoop like this. And this hole was for the cart. When you push the cart in. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I, 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 have a, I have a demonstration. Uh, see if I can. Uh, okay, here's the front of the cart machine. Fidelipack. And let's see if we can zoom in on that. There's the, there's the business end inside there. And uh, there's the solenoid up toward the, the top of your screen there. And uh, then there's the, the, the card cage there has the, uh, the audio amps and the record electronics. This is a recorder too. And there's the pinch roller that can come up. I, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a third hand to uh, show you the pinch roller coming up. And there are the, the record and play heads are under that shield right there. You can barely see them. They're square and shiny back inside there. And well, so that's the, why the cart the, has three. One of the measures of a good cart machine, too, is how fast a solenoid could pull up the pinch roller because, you know, a high, in a, in a, especially top 40 station in a high energy environment, you wanted those songs to start immediately. And so, you know, you, you'd see how fast the, the machines would start by how quickly the pinch roller would fly up and start playing the tape after you hit the play button on front. And sometimes the solenoids would start to get old. And that's how you'd know is you'd hit the button and instead of going snap and kind of go, Ugh. And it would, yeah. you know, take forever for and, the thing to start, and and then you and, and you had to be careful if you were in kind of a dusty environment because if the uh, uh, if the solenoid plunger got a little bit of dust on it, or if the uh, spring, the the, uh, the reverse tension spring uh, started to lose some of its springiness, what would happen is the puck wouldn't fall down as uh, when the machine stopped, the, the the puck would pull away, so the tape would stop, and if and it wouldn't go down quite as fast, and uh, Joe Jock, who was a little, uh, you know. A little, uh, well, let's anxious. see. What, what's what, yeah, yeah, a little anxious. Would grab the car, Overzumps. yank it, and he'd take a chunk out of the bottom of the puck. So the next time you put the car oh, in, you'd hear, yeah. you'd hear the song <laughs> on the air there. <laughs> oh, man. A couple, I want to point out a couple more things here. Here's the, the power transformer for the power supply. And you notice it's not a standard square frame power transformer, and neither is a switching power supply. It's a toroidal power transformer. Now, who knows why they used a toroidal power transformer in a piece of gear like this? Hmm? Better efficiencies, low heat, lower uh, magnetic flux around it? Yeah, lower magnetic flux around it is, is what I always understood. I may be wrong about that, but that's what, that's what I understood. Uh, yeah, it was but more that, efficient that way of screen, uh, yeah. converting DC. And then here, here's that, that solenoid. Now, this one has an adjustment. Let me see if I can get my finger about where it is. There is a, a, a little screw adjustment. It's a, it's a, I think it's a hex head. Yeah, a little hex screw adjustment. And that adjusts how fast air can come out the back of this thing. So if, if you tighten it up, the air hole was smaller and the pinch roller would come up more slowly and, and more quietly. And if you loosened it up all the way, it would go, it would snap up. But sometimes the, 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 the solenoid might bottom out and go, you know, go, you know, like a good hard thwap inside, so that that wasn't. And also, would burn the, the tape. Bottom. Yep, it would do what? Burn the tape? Yeah, if you if you had the uh, solenoid too fast, too tight, you'd put a burn mark and wear off the oxide on the tape. Eventually, it would ah. snap at that point. Yeah. So we're we're uh, so we're still in we're wearing out. Still in teaching mode here. Burke, can you zoom up on, on this black block right here where my finger is? This block. This was a great design. Uh, so many. 
cart machines were poorly designed with regard to the head block. This is the part that holds the head, and it's got to be mechanically just wonderful, just really well done. On so many cart machines, it was just stamped metal, and it was just awful. This was this one was very well done, as were a lot of them made by ITC. Um, uh, this one uh, it has a couple of adjustments here for azimuth. Now, this is a recorder, so it has two heads, a record head and a playback head. But they have adjustments for, what, height? Uh, yeah, height, height and, uh, and insertion. Zenith. And azimuth, and, and then lock down. And tilt back and forth. Oh, yeah, zenith. Yeah, yeah. they used to. Yep. Wow. So, yeah, I had to keep all that stuff. Yeah. You know, as a contract engineer, it seems like I'm, I made a lot of car payments. <laughs> adjusting adjusting heads at, at, at radio stations. And, and we used to have these little... Uh, little test jigs to uh, put in there to make sure that the uh, heads were far enough and not too far uh, out of the head block so you, you know so you wouldn't uh, misseat the cartridge when they went in also there was another one that you could put between the uh, capstan and the pinch roller to make sure that they were both straight and aligned so you didn't have the pinch roller pulled in a little too much so and then you'd grab your you'd grab your cart with the tone on it pop that in start to start tweaking Standard Tape Laboratories, yep. Cartridge Alignment Tape. This is at a flux By flexibility voice. of 250 nanoweber's per meter. My voice should be coming from the left <laughs> channel. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard that recording In a few phase. times, haven't you, Tom? Just a oh couple. Well, look, at what I, look, look, look at what I've got here. Look at this. Is this awesome or what? Okay, it's, it's a weighs Collins 20. Remote Mixer. It, it's a who? Collins Remote Mixer. Oh, Collins Remote Mixer. Yes, indeed. And it's it's a 212Z1 remote amplifier from Collins. It has, so it has, uh, on the back, it's got some uh, inputs. Looks like it's got about four mic inputs. And it's got, oh, look at there. I'll show you the back. Uh, get this thing turned around. Okay, so it's got <laughs> four mic inputs right there. And then, whoops, wrong way. And then it's got, there's the line level inputs. They're binding posts. You know, the, no RCA connectors here, boys. Actually, it's, I think uh, those are outputs, serious. Kirk. One, one says PA on it. One's probably right, line up. the telephone. They, they, yeah. they, these top two said line line one, line two. It, yeah, I and, think those are outputs. Oh, you know what? You're probably right. Uh, yep, output line one, output line two. So the inputs, I wonder, they're, well, they're all XLRs. Were they all mics? Mic inputs, though. I don't know. That's why I got invented pads. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, so it's a, it had a, a connection for the telephone line here and for the PA here. Sure enough. Uh, you could run this thing off batteries or off AC, apparently. There was a lamp with a lamp with a dimmer control for the VU meter. If you were in the symphony orchestra, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want the, the lamp turned all the way up. <laughs> well, not, so, what a, man. That's, that's oh, the new that's Axie design for 2012. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> I, I do kind of miss those days. Okay. Retro design. Uh, what's this, guys? Filter cavity. That's a filter cavity. I'm going to say 450 band. Yeah. Now this, well, that's 450. you're absolutely right. Yep, now, there it now, is. And, Tom, why did you why did you say 450 band? What made you say that? Uh, looking at the size of it, uh, because the uh, that, that's about a quarter wave at uh, 450.35, according to the label. So who knows uh, what's inside I, this thing? Well, first of all, not, let's let's do the, what's a, the, the let's do the, the <laughs> not much is this right. is a football. Here, here's the top of it. It's got two. Let me get this right. It's got two N connectors for RF, and then it's got this this vernier plunger adjustment here that makes something go up and down inside. So it's a uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a big cavity, and well, it and, you'll, and you'll also stuff. notice, Kirk, if you look at those N connectors, at least one of them uh, probably has some attenuation on it. Uh, because uh, if you were to take one of those out, it's got a loop on the bottom of it for uh, for coupling. And depending yep. on how much coupling you had, depended on how much attenuation you would get through there. Most Which, of, of them course, do. Would, it says would, uh, would affect the uh, shape it, of the uh, filter. It's calibrated insertion loss: a quarter dB, half dB, one or two dB. You could there loosen these screws around it. Oh, you got one there too. Okay, good. Yep, yep this is from another it, company. Four fifty also. Oh yeah. Um, everybody's so you got just keep those around the basement. What are you talking about? Do you just keep those <laughs> little plunger on there. Here's a two meter one. What is it? Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> He's got one of those two meters. I put beer in those. 
put beer in those. Oh, my God. Who says there isn't any in mine? Tap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. <laughs> We're, uh, we're we're not far from the end of the show here. I got one more piece of hardware to show, and then some uh, then some QSL cards. Oh, uh, by the way, we're we're broadcasting. Oh, uh, yeah. We're we're doing the show live from the uh, the studios, the lobby actually of WHBC in Canton, Ohio. And I want to thank them very much for making the room available to to do this week in radio tech uh, from here. Uh, I'm Kirk Harnack, along with uh, Tom Ray, Chris Tobin, and Chris Tarr on this week in radio tech. We're just having a blast here showing off some of the, the things from the, the storeroom, uh, the memorabilia room, the junk room at uh, here at WHBC. This is just amazing. All right, I got this thing here. And I love these things. And they don't oh, make them awesome. anymore. Who, That's the who best. wants to tell me all about this? 111C coil. 111C it's coils. A it's a transformer. Yeah. And the cool thing yeah. about that transformer is it is it, it's it'll pass from... Oh, about 20 hertz all the way up past 75 kilohertz. So you could actually put FM composite through that uh, transformer if you wanted to and isolate your composite signal. I you put a square wave in Well, I did to prevent hum. Yes, to prevent hum. Um, we've talked about these before, and, and these are so useful. If you've got to get audio and just analog audio from one place to another, maybe over a couple miles of wire. You put this at each end of it, and you uh, you wire it appropriately for 600 ohms in. Maybe you want to do 150 ohms on the uh, on the wire side, and then at the other end, do the opposite: 150 ohms facing the wire, and and 600 ohms uh, uh, the the characteristic impedance uh, facing the your, your equipment. You'll get really nice flat audio, even with a very long wire uh, uh, there. You know, you can tell a little bit about how it works or how it's wound inside. By the shape of the bottom, there's this uh, big dimple in the bottom where it's convex coming out. So that kind of tells me that the windings must go around, well, must go around this way inside there. Is that, is that what it tells you? Anybody ever been inside one of these things? No. 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 I, I, would, imagine, I would imagine that there's steel uh, or mu metal and wire and tar. Yes. Oh, it's a construction okay. design you'll never see again. Yes. Yeah, yeah, those are, are those awesome. are fantastic. If you find them, hoard them because uh, they are so useful. And, and they're very hard to find. As a matter of fact, there's one uh, there's one here going for fifty six dollars on eBay right now. Yeah. Yep. I think I think I sold several on e eBay for about seventy five dollars. Shame on me. Yeah, you yeah, place they, a bid? All right. you, those place are a great. Bid? Those are great. If you if you can find one man, hang on to it. Well, here we have. Um, we're going to wrap the show up here with some QSL cards. Um, Tom Ray, what does QSL mean? Uh, QSL is is a short uh, lingo for uh, uh, I, I contact made, and I understand. Oh, okay. Well, that would make sense. It, 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 so it, it's an it's an acknowledgement that I've uh, that, that I understood what you had what 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 we've done, and we've had a conversation, and uh, you're just confirming the fact that we did that. Well, let's look at it. You know, I always thought it was it was just uh, uh, ham radio uh, operators, uh, hams, uh, amateur radio operators that had QSL cards. But you know, radio stations do too. If you hear a station and you want to report that you heard it, maybe some significant distance away, due to atmospheric conditions or the fact that you've got a heck of an antenna. Uh, here's one. Uh, this one. It says, "Your good neighbor, WHBC, established 1925, Canton, Ohio." And um, confirming reception report of February 16th, 1970, from 159 to 244 a.m. Eastern Time, John Shen, chief engineer. I don't know where this came from, though. I don't know who this was sent, uh, sent to. Oh, my goodness. Ah, well, this is, uh, this is kind of funny. Check this one out. This is, this is uh, uh, Dale's uh, QSL card. <laughs> So he's a, he's he's a ham operator. He'll send this out to folks who uh See, that's that's my fear of getting into ham radio too much. That could be me. I am not I don't <laughs> yes. Tom, is is that what happens when you spend too much time in the in the ham shack? I wouldn't know. I uh I never come out of the ham shack. <laughs> <laughs> but here's a here you go. That's here's yours. Thank you, card. Beautiful. Yep. That that's the uh uh, Moodna Viaduct uh, Railroad Trestle, which is about 100 years old, used to be on the Erie Line. 
You know, hmm. uh, I was wondering, why do, why do so many U.S. AM radio stations get reception reports from places like Norway, right? All right. I, 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 even, hey, I've engineered for some AM stations that got reception reports from Finland and, and Norway. Well, I, I, I have the answer. They, they, they have radio clubs and, and guys have hobbies over there where they actually go out in the woods and they'll take an antenna. They'll, they'll take them. They'll string a one or two miles worth of wire through the trees in the wintertime and they'll just sit there and listen for hours. Yeah. Well, and there's another reason. It's not very far to Norway if you go that over too. the pole. It's not that far. And, and, you know, back, back in the 20s and 1930s, the QSL cards for broadcast stations actually uh, uh, helped tell where your signal was going and, and, and what your reception was like. Uh, nowadays, with, with, you know, because there were very few stations on the air. Nowadays, with the amount of stations that are on the air, uh, it, you know, it's, it's a nice acknowledgement that someone picked you up far away. But it, it really doesn't tell us all that much anymore. But uh, back in the 20s and 30s, boy, it told you a heck of a lot. Well, here's, a, here's, here's one more picture. I guess this is the, the transmitter, the FM transmitter here. And uh, I think that would be, is, is, is that Nipper or is it supposed to be Nipper? <laughs> Probably supposed to be it's Nipper, but key. that looks like a BE transmitter. <laughs> I was going to say, that's a, looks yeah, like a BE right. transmitter. there. Yeah, not an RCA, but a BE. All right. Uh, I think I'm out of show and tell. This is, yep, this is, yep, that's it. That's 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 the news that is news. All the news that's that's fit to talk about from WHBC in Canton, Ohio. So uh, surely our our little show here has brought back a, a a couple of memories. Maybe not of you using this equipment, but think back to some of the earliest gear that that you were exposed to, gentlemen, and you did use. Maybe you can um, uh, whoever raises their hand first could could uh, could tell us about an experience of when you first got into broadcasting. Or maybe you ran across, you know, something in a, in a storeroom. Or maybe you took some equipment out that was really, really old. Something that was maybe uh, nicotine-covered from an old control room where, where they smoked 24-7. Um, uh, don't all raise your hands at once, but, uh, hey, Tom Ray, you got any, you got any a little story for us of some old gear? Yeah, yeah well, when I worked, out, uh, worked at the WDRC in Hartford out in the shed, we had a, uh, a couple of... Um, what, what the heck? Well, they were RCA turntables, um, which you know, which had the washing machine motor underneath, but well, and, and 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 a physical light switch like you'd find on the wall of your house to start the thing. Um, platters were, I'm going to say, 18 inches. I mean, it, it was a big platter, heavy, but it had two tone arms. And I had always wondered what the heck. And was it a main and a backup? Uh, uh, Come to find out that in the uh, in the days of radio, like in the 1930s, when they used to put on radio programs, um, and, and and actually it was more more like towards the 1940s when they started putting sound effects on record instead of doing them uh, uh, all in live in the studio, you could queue up two separate sections of a of, of a record with two separate sound effects on that turntable. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. It was just, it was just the coolest things. You look at the thing; it had the tone arm in the normal position on on the right hand side. And then it had one right behind it, on the you know on, on the top of the turntable going this way. Oh yeah, and yeah. Okay, you know, it's just you. the weirdest thing to see. Hmm. Unbelievable. Well, uh, the young whippersnapper, Mister Tar, you come across old gear, or is all the stuff you oh, come sure. across like from the nineteen eighties? <laughs> no, I, I mean I've worked at a couple of small market stations where you know it's it's like walking into uh, into nineteen fifty. You know, it's got the the you know, the old uh, RCA console and you know the the big old uh, you know the big old platter turntables like like uh, Tom Ray was talking about. So yeah, early in my career, back in the eighties, uh, you know, I've walked into some studios, worked in some studios that were like that. So you, and you still do every once in a while as a as a contract guy. I come a, I come across storerooms and and things like that that have have old gear in it, and I I appreciate it. It's it's always good to see that stuff and. Some of the stuff today still works great, and and some of the stuff is still in service. But uh, yeah, no, I run into it every so often. And Mr. Tobin, certainly working at, oh, at yes. CBS like you did for some years, you, you, they had to have rooms of. Oh my goodness, when is this from? <clears throat> well, I will say that early on in my career, I did work at a radio station where our transmitter site was a bomb shelter, and uh, my first few days there was interesting. Walked into the building at the base of the tower and uh, found a trap door 
And I asked the uh, engineer that was leaving, what is this for? He goes, oh, you'll find out. I, you, you know, it'll be a surprise. I'm like, oh, how nice. <laughs> Open the door. <laughs> yeah. Open the door. Had the creaky <laughs> sound that you'd expect. Looked down a staircase. It's dark. No light. I'm like, oh, this should be fun. So I made sure it was a bright early day when I went down. And uh, sure enough, bomb shelter. And inside was a uh, studio, small studio for two people. It was a RCA mixer, uh, a lot of civil defense uh, K uh, rations or can rations, and a transcription turntable, and a couple of microphones with the RCA DX, right? Yeah, the salt shakers, the, 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 the cylindrical ones or the Johnny Carson microphone. And it was on, on a boom, on boom mics. It was uh, pretty wild. And actually, the stuff worked. I powered it up. It actually fired up and worked. And the uh, coal, uh, not coal, charcoal filtered air ducts that led, led upstairs out behind the generator shack. Uh, it was wild. <laughs> that was the oldest stuff I found. But at CBS, working at the CBS Broadcast Center, uh, there's some history there. That, that facility went online in 1952. It was a, uh, a milk farm, a dairy, before they moved in. And in the basement, oh, one, two, three, three basements down, was where the uh, cattle, the cows were brought in on train. There was actually a railroad level. Uh, there are railroad tracks that pass beneath the building, but they're all closed up. And that's where they bring in the cows. And in the basement, uh, if you can picture a small, not small, but probably about 20 feet wide, these half like little alcoves, stone alcoves, and a slab, concrete slab inside the alcove. And around the perimeter of the uh, slab was a cutout for where you'd have drainage for, you know, water and whatever else to, a, to another cutout that went along the length of the, the basement room. And that's where they would milk the cows. And it was called the... Uh, <laughs> Oh, uh, what was the oh Sheffield Farms? Sheffield Farms, and I uh -huh. actually found, I actually have a, a glass milk bottle that I found at the transmitter site of a radio station prior to my arrival to working at CBS. When we were digging up the ground, it was a uh, former city dump. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Trash dump. And I said, "Wow, this is interesting." Sheffield Farms. Only to find out uh, ten years later, I'd work in the building that this came from. <laughs> So, wow. so talking about old stuff and the equipment that we had at the broadcast center, uh, the studios, some of the studios I got to work in were actually the ones that you would, would have watched uh, Walter Cronkite, Edward R. Murrow uh, broadcast from. Uh, the RCA, some of it was RCA equipment, a lot of Western Electric equipment, uh, the, the, the vintage material. Just To this day, some of it's still usable. And you know, now they use for props. But you know, we had you know, a dozen TV studios and half the sound stages we used for all kinds of stuff. So it was just, yeah, it's like walking through a museum, an active museum. Uh, yeah, it was just, it was wild. Uh, yeah, I could say over the years I've come across some good stuff. But there, Kurt, you, you have some really good vintage material. Well, I've got a couple of guys to, to thank here for this. We're going to have to wrap up the show here pretty quickly. Thanks for your, for your stories, gentlemen. Uh, so I've, I've been broadcasting from WHBC in Canton, Ohio, a station that's been on the air since... Uh, 1925, uh, so it's almost 90 years, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, 90 years. Uh, Dale Lamb is the chief engineer here, right? Yeah, yeah that's okay. correct. All right. And also, uh, Jason Stroll is the IT guy here. Correct. Yeah. So I've been working with both of these guys today and had a great time and sure thank them for their, their hospitality. Um, hey, I'll be back in Canton, Ohio tomorrow if you want to come by and see us. So uh, uh, we have uh, two things to do before we wrap up the show. Number one, give away uh, an Omnia AXE. Oh, did you have something there? A T-shirt. Oh, that's this is better than a T-shirt. This is a polo shirt. You sure this hadn't been worn? <laughs> it's been long, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it says News Talk fourteen eighty WHBC Canton, Ohio. That's beautiful. That's my color red. I like that. All right, I won't change right here, but I will wear it tomorrow. And uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. I appreciate that. And thank you for the. I we were going into the show fifteen minutes before the show, wondering what we're going to talk about tonight. And I was calling Tom and calling Chris and Chris, and what are we can talk about. I don't know. And uh, well, uh, then uh, uh, Dale came up with uh, all this gear to show, and and this has really been great. So thanks very much for the opportunity. Thank you for having us, and thank you for showcasing a place. Uh, Jason and I both uh, we really love this. Radio's in our blood, both of us, and. We're in hog heaven, but don't, don't let the boss hear. <laughs> don't let the boss hear. <laughs> I'm working for free, but don't tell the boss. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we don't want to give away an Omnia AXE. One of the ways that we promote the show and pe more people viewing the show is by uh, uh, asking you to follow us, either me, uh, at K Harnack on Twitter, or follow at Torch Show on Twitter. And when you receive an announcement that the show's going to start and something about, the, well, what a little tease for the show, if you retweet that to your followers, then you're eligible to win an Omnia AXE. That's software for Windows that does audio processing 
and does uh, streaming. It uh, it will uh, you know encode a stream into MP3 or AAC, uh, different flavors of AAC. Pretty cool little product. And normally it's a five hundred dollar software package. We're going to give one away free right now. I need, gentlemen. I need. Well, how, okay, Dale. I need a a number between one and thirty one. That's going to be a random number, and we're going to pick a winner from that. Should I say it? Oh, sure. Give, what, yeah, give me a number. Twenty-one. Twenty-one. All right, that'd be a what a jack and a, a, a jack and a ten. Uh, twenty-one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, looks like if I got this. If I started the right place, looks like our winner is John Meek uh, on Twitter. He goes by at Electron John. John Meek is our winner of Omnia AXE. And uh, John is a musician, tinkerer, space nerd, and director of Camp Vineyard, according to his Twitter profile. So, Electron John, I've never met you, but uh, we're fixing to talk about Omni AXE, and we'll get you a license for that. So, thanks again. I, I appreciate that. Electron John has 110 followers. Uh, also, thanks to uh, Axia Audio for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Appreciate that very much. And let's see, do we have any? Oh, yeah, we need a show title. That's right. Um, we have a show title. We can, let's go check with the chat room and see what the chat room wants to suggest for a show title. Oh, man, this is the bir Birdhouse. Oh, Birdhouse sounds pretty good. Birdhouse for a show title. Um, junk from the Attic. <laughs> okay, Junk from the Attic. That's actually Going a pretty retro. good title. What's, which one, Junk from the Attic? Junk from the Attic. I'm going right. Junk from the Attic. I like, it actually came from the basement. Like nobody has to know that. <laughs> I like going retro myself. That was kind of good. Going retro? This old this birdhouse. This old birdhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Okay, okay. that's it. We spent some, we some time on that. Ding, that's ding, it. Ding, this ding. old birdhouse. Uh, and and uh, last century in Radio Tech. That was good, Bob Holowenko. Very funny. <laughs> This old birdhouse came from uh, Dale Poco. Okay, thank you, Dale. Well, that's the show. Appreciate you. And we'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody.